Hi, I'm Tommy Thomas. I want to welcome you back to the show, How to Beat the Odds. My guest today, Eric Earhart from all the way up on the East Coast. Is it North Carolina? Yes, sir. North Carolina, up right by the ocean. He's a pastor of a little church up there, an awesome church. They're doing an awesome work. They're feeding a lot of people, clothing a lot of people, helping a lot of people come a hold of, get a hold of the truth of Jesus Christ. Not a watered-down doctrine, not a feel-good doctrine, but about righteousness and repentance and getting the sin out of our life. And that's what we're supposed to be preaching and hearing the word and teaching and that's the kind of teaching we sit under every week at our church. We hear the truth. We got to die so he can live. We die, he lives. Powerful. Well, he was sharing his testimony with us earlier today. We met him. My wife was going down the street one day about a year and a half ago. There was a billboard. Nothing's too hard for God. Amen. Dot org. She looked up at the billboard, saw that, said, well, you don't see billboards like that very often. Came home, told me about it. We went and we opened it up. And on the website, guess what? There was Eric's testimony and eight or ten other people's testimonies dealing with different things. He'd been in prison and God's grace. He called him in the midst of prison, drug dealer, all that kind of stuff. But God's a miracle working God. He loves every one of us. And it's because he first loved us that any one of us come into the kingdom of God. It's his love and the wooing of the Holy Spirit that draws us in because we get a hold of the truth that we need a Savior, that our life's muck and junk. We're sinners. But he'll turn it all around. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus and fall in love with him. That's the good news. Well, let's meet him right now. Hey, brother, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Tommy. What part of North Carolina up there? Gatesville, North Carolina, 280 member town. 280 members? Yes, sir. How long you had your church there? <clears throat> we started the church October 27, 2002, so we're celebrating seven years this year. Seven years. Amen. And you said there's a lot of churches in that area. There's there. about 72 churches in Gates County, a county of about 10,000 people. That's there's a lot of churches. A lot, a lot of churches and a lot of uh, cornfields, and uh, it's a very rural community. But what I like is you have every color and creed in your church, don't you? Oh, uh, the Lord's blessed us. Uh, in fact, it's the first church in 300-year history of that county to be a fully integrated uh, multiracial church. And God is bringing in the rich and the poor, the young and the old, black and white, Hispanic. It doesn't matter. God is just touching them and bringing them in. That's the way God likes to do it. Isn't Amen. It? People are people. We're all the same in the kingdom. <laughs> That's right. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, I was listening to your testimony. I went back to the website earlier today and mm -hmm. all, and it talked about your daddy was a fisherman, and he was a man's kind of man. You looked up to dad, yes. and you went to a Catholic church mm -hmm. when you was 11 years old, and what happened? Well, we, uh, my father took me down. He had a policy. Uh, he didn't attend church himself, but he uh, had a policy that at 11 years of age, we'd go down to be confirmed. And we got to decide after that whether we ever wanted to go to church again or not. Um, and so he took me down, and sure enough, I went in to see uh, the uh, priest at the church for my confirmation. We were doing the interview, and he asked me, he said, Eric, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, well, I said, I'm going to be like you. I'm going to have a church one day. And he said, oh, well, let me tell you what that entails. And he began to talk to me about a vow of poverty and a vow of celibacy. And as an 11-year-old, I knew what poverty was. I was living in it. But I didn't know what celibacy was. So I asked him, I said, uh, uh, what is celibacy? And the way he described it at the time, he said, well, he said, it means you're not going to be able to be like your father. You're not going to be able to have a family. You're not going to be able to have children. And for an 11-year-old uh, who worshipped his mm. dad, um, that just uh, struck me wrong. So I ended the interview. I walked out. My dad had an old 57 Ford pickup. Got in, slammed the door, and my dad just said, uh, boy, what'd you decide? And I said, I never want to go to church again, Dad. And he said, okay, let's go. And he started up the truck, and we drove off. Wow. So what happened to your life after that? Church wasn't a part of it. Church wasn't a part of it. Um, but very shortly after that, drugs began. I began to uh, run marijuana for the little local uh, drug dealer in our neighborhood. And uh, drugs were very prevalent at that time in the uh, uh, 70s, and uh, they were everywhere. Uh, at least in my community they were. And we're in, in, in the fishing community is a very tough community. Men work hard, they play hard, they fight hard, and they party hard. So drugs were drugs and alcohol were just a common part, pornography, common part of my life growing up. And you were a fisherman? I was a fisherman as well, yes, sir. Okay, now as you got a little older, a friend gave you a boat to use to go out and catch some fish, but you kind of switched from fishing to something else, didn't you? <laughs> we, we made a big switch. Um, we were running a 38-foot Buddy Davis, an offshore fishing vessel, um, catching tuna. And we were selling it. We had a, sea, uh, a refrigerated truck. We were selling seafood to the, uh, to, right to the restaurants. And I had made an acquaintance, and he was a drug dealer. And uh, when things began to go bad for the business, he offered me to traffic some drugs down from New York for him. 
And I, I, I got to say that at first I thought, no, oh, I'm better than that. I'm, I'm, you know, a little bit of self righteousness rose up. You and did I, drugs, but as far as yeah, traffic, and that's another travel. thing. Yeah, it's yeah. one thing to party, but it's yeah. another thing. And uh, but I gave in. And when I did, I crossed the line. I've got to tell you, I crossed the line that darkness entered my soul in a way that it had never done. Of course, we're born in sin, right. and we are sinners, right. and we need Jesus Christ. But there's a uh, there's a line you can cross sometimes where you open yourself up to the demonic. Big time, um, that's, big time. Uh, um, just yeah. bigger than what you know. Yeah. yeah. But you had a little bit of a conscience. I mean, you, you were kind of particular about some things you did. Sure. Well, you know, God uh, tells us in Romans 1 that every man's been born with a conscience and that there is no such thing as an atheist. God knows. God said we all know that he's God. We just choose not to worship him as God. And so uh, my conscience bothered me. I, I, it was one thing to, to defend yourself. It was another thing to have to go out and harm people just because of the nature of the business of the drug game. And, and it did bother me. And I'd have to come home and I would drink and smoke myself to sleep pretty much every night. You also had a confrontation with somebody because they owed you some money and they weren't going to pay you. What happened? Well, sure. In the drug game, you got to have a reputation. Yeah. You know, we, we, we believe God because His Word is true. And so when I wake up tomorrow, the Word of God doesn't change. And when I wake up the next day, it doesn't change. And so in the world, we value someone whose Word is, is their bond, we said, in the drug game. And so when someone owed you money and they wouldn't pay and you threatened them, you had to back it up. If not, then your word meant nothing and people would just, uh, 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 they would not pay you and they would take. So I threatened this man and I had to go back it up and I ended up uh, um, harming him. You walked in his house on Christmas Eve. What happened? Well, I kicked his door in and I took a Czechoslovakian CZ-52 assault rifle and I walked in, kicked his door in, and I stuck the muzzle of it in his mouth. And I pulled the trigger because I had already confronted him twice before and he um, was telling people in the community he was not going to pay me. And so I just decided I need to go ahead and take him out. And if I didn't take him out, then the competition would see me as an easy mark and they would come take me out. So I saw taking this man out as a, as a life preserver for me to show other drug dealers that, that I was not to be messed with. And uh, I pulled the trigger and the gun didn't fire. And I, I jacked the round back, I jacked the bolt back, and the round flipped out of the chamber, and I caught it. And I looked at the primer, and of course the primer had been dented. And um, by the grace of God, I had old uh, uh, government issue, old Czechoslovakian issue, armor pierced and ammunition in it, old government uh, ammunition. And by the grace of God, the weapon didn't fire. And so I took the bayonet that was on the end of the rifle, and I stuck it in the man's neck and pinned him to his couch. And with all the arrogance of uh, 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 ignorance, I said, God wants you to live tonight. Now this, now this guy, you put the bayonet.